Between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of. And on to this, Conan, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. <laughs> All right, this is Rusty with the Nets, and tonight I have JP, and we might have some other guests pop on. Who knows? Um, uh, but uh, JP, how are you doing? I'm good, Rusty. What's up? How are you, man? Thanks for asking. I'm doing good. Uh, good to hear from you. Good to have you back. Um, so that was a little intro. A little uh, of obviously, we're going to talk about Conan the Barbarian, the 1982 version uh, with. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, so before I get into production things, I just wanted to ask you, like, you know, I don't know. I think I want to know. Um, I think me and you both like Arnold to a large degree uh, with his action movies and stuff like that. But I asked you to come on and do this like a couple of days ago, and I didn't know, like, I want to know, like, how you came across it, if you ever remember seeing part of it, if it, if you just went your whole life and never watched it until a couple of days ago, and that, and that kind of background. So, like, how did you, how did you, what was the first time you watched it, and, you know, and, and just kind of, not too much detail, but, you know, did you like it, what did you think about it, uh, in general, like, you know, um, that type of thing? I honestly never watched it until a couple days ago, um, but I but I did like it because obviously Arnie is just that unbridled masculinity, and he, <laughs> we definitely we definitely need that. Um, what is what is the Arnold? What is like for you the Arnold movie that you think is I don't know like quintessential nostalgia for you as a kid, as a teenager, or, or I mean. Did, did you have any of that for him in, in a lot of ways? Or, you know, was it Terminator? Was it Predator? Was it Total Recall, Running Man? I don't know. You know, was it um, something else? I forgot, <laughs> you know. Predator. Predator okay. was quintess is just quintessential Arnold. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the most memeable. <laughs> um, Terminator, obviously, it was a great movie. I mean, that was or Terminator 2. Was a great I'm trying to think of some of the other, like Last Action Hero, um, cool Kindergarten too. Cop, you know, some type <laughs> of funny, you know, type of thing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, he's just, yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I probably have a little more, <laughs> I don't know why, how, whatever. My dad, like, you know, got me into him. Like, we were, I remember watching DVDs, whatever, uh, that we get at the freaking uh, video store. Um, and also, you know, in the not in our early nineties and stuff like that. And, and it was obviously films that I didn't like go to a theater to see cause they already happened, but it was definitely old school in the sense of like, you're going to, you're going to blockbuster or movie time or something like that. And you're picking up, a, um, an action movie, a DVD with him. Um, and luckily he, I think like let me watch all these type of movies, you know, when I was like nine, 10 years old. And, and I loved them of course, as a, as a boy. And so I have, you know, a lot of fondness in my heart for Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I don't care about all this politics and, you know, I, I know his indiscretions and as a person, and this is why I tell people, um, you know, how am I supposed to judge a man? Like, I, I don't know, 
I don't, I don't want to know his personal life, you know, and, and unfortunately actors, singers, musicians, entertainers, this stuff gets thrust into the limelight and it's part of the deal. Right. But in some ways, but I just feel like it's sad and I don't want to make it, the podcast isn't about celebrities and tabloids and stuff like that, but you know what I mean? Like, I just feel, I just don't want, to, I wish we didn't know. I wish we didn't know about his personal life or any, any of these people that, well, are, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of funny culturally though. He's become like the strong man archetype, like, uh, Zap Brannigan or wait a minute. Is that, the, is that the guy from the Simpsons? Is it Zap Brannigan? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> But he's like, and obviously in The Simpsons, he's this big strong man with a Ar very Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of kind of voice. Um, then there's the guy in Futurama that might be Zap Brannigan. Oh man, you know what? The guy from The Simpsons is gonna kill. It's gonna kill me now. Hold on, it's Max something. It's got. A <laughs> what? Well, um, well, I think what you're saying is like, I mean, you're saying that. Arnold has reached the status of of icon, you know, in the sense yeah. of of yeah. entertainment and in uh, you know uh, celebrity status or whatever. He he's reached he's a meme. He's gif. He's gifs, right? He's whatever gifs gifs. Um, I think gifs. I think gif sounds stupid. <laughs> um, uh, team gifs, boy. The um. So um. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like he. He's just a guy that, like, I mean, the thing is, man, he, he won seven Mr. Universes in a row. Seven. You know, it's crazy. Um, You know, and then he did that documentary called uh, Pumping Iron in, like, the late 70s. That became kind of a hit. I mean, people in the 70s used to go to theaters to watch documentaries. Not so much anymore. Uh, but back then they did. And then pretty soon okay like there was a couple movies whatever whatever this was like one of the breakthrough films um i'm going to just talk a little bit about the production and then we will get into some of the stuff that i wanted to get into um and we'll get going with like you know we're not going to do scene by scene right we're just going to do things that stood out to us and talk like we know like we have with the episode big lebowski which was really fun and star wars uh which was also really fun and and, and tolkien that we did so this is the mm -hmm. fourth podcast that we've done together um so we kind of know how each other is you know that's a good thing about having a return guest um anyway so this film was this film was uh, directed by John Milius, and it was written by John Milius. Uh, originally, the script was written by Oliver Stone, who's a director that I actually like, that a lot of people that I hang out with don't like, but I do like him. Um, but um, anyway, the background between the script is that essentially uh, the, the producers and studios uh, wanted to do this film as early as 1970. And then, you know, there was some effort to make the film in the mid 70s. It kind of fell through. Uh, and then um, Milius was appointed as director and he wrote, he rewrote uh, Oliver Stone's script. And the final, the final screenplay obviously has a lot of themes weaved into it that aren't completely and totally Robert E. Howard's uh, Conan the Barbarian. Now, Robert E. Howard was a Pulp Fiction writer. I've done an episode on Pulp Fiction. Um, I, I enjoy Tarzan. You know, I enjoy uh, Edward Burroughs. Um, I enjoy some Robert E. Howard. I enjoy um, pulpy type of um, over-the-top fiction. And Conan is one of these, like, big things that are within this. And that story that Robert E. Howard wrote initially was in 1932. And he wrote quite a few uh, short stories and stuff with Conan as the main character. And, um, and uh, another guy that was like in – so like just real quick, the, the kind of lore behind Conan is that, you know, Robert E. Howard creates this character. And Robert E. Howard is this kind of author, pulp writer – that loves like high adventure and and overt masculinity and 
he symbolizes this in this character that he creates, Conan. He he has other books that he makes, other stories that he makes, but you know, the movie is highly based on Robert E. Howard's Conan, though it's not only based on that. And it's also inspired by Frank uh, Frazetta's paintings of Conan. If you just Google Frank Frazetta, you'll see any number of cool artwork and stuff. Um, I really like, enjoyed it. Um, uh, there was a couple different main Conan illustrators and, and people that propagated and proliferated the artwork. There's all types of weird you know, we could get into the lore of that, but this we're not here to talk about that. You know, we're here to talk about uh, the movie itself. But what's to know about it, I think, is that, you know, it, the thing that you need to realize about Conan is that it, it's supposed to basically take place with a person that's not in a real, like a real historical world per se, but yet is, so it's kind of, it meshes what we would call fantasy with what, people also call um you know um uh sorcery um i forgot the the, the term it was like epic sword and sorcery you know sword and sorcery and so sword, okay. and, sword and sorcery is just like a, a a catch-all phrase about it's not really the same as tolkien's you know or lewis or uh D, or um dungeon and dragons fantasy of that scale it's like a pulpy version of fantasy, and that would be sort yeah. It's of, like it's like a little bit more Warhammer 40k. Yeah, exactly. And people that game and stuff like that would probably. There was a time in the 80s, man, like where you had a lot of this stuff going on. You had Excalibur. Uh, they made a, like an, an 82. I think it was an 80. 82 was a big year. I think um, there are super uh, cool movies that were made in that year, like the. Th the thing was made in that year. Um, okay. Um, you know, um, uh, if you just Google, like, uh, JP, go ahead and just Google 1982 uh, Like films. Blockbuster movies? Yeah, just say 1982 films, and you'll see what comes up, and you'll be amazed. Um, it was a huge year uh, for that. And so you have these different things kind of colliding into this. But you have a lot of things in the 80s you you don't see this stuff like Here's you don't. Best movies. Here we go. Yeah. Hey, hey Jamie, pull that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. I mean, it just because it's amazing. Blade Runner. Yes. Uh, let's see. The I thing, mean, uh, Beastmaster. Yep. King yep. of Comedy. Blade Runner. Um, Forty Eight Hours. E. T. Yeah. E. T. Man. Tron. Tron. Whatever. Um, Pulcher guys. I mean, I could go on. Uh, it, it was yep, a Tron. Yep, it was a big past times at Richmond High. The Dark Crystal, one of my favorites. Yeah, man. Uh, well, Rocky Three, First Blood. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, Rambo, yeah. but first, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, well, ET, dude, I mean, yeah, you Pulcher guys, I saw that movie. You skip over. You can't skip over Poltergeist and ET. ET and Poltergeist were huge blockbusters. Huge. I mean, in the thing, yeah, people talk about that today as one of the best kind of like um, alien type movies. Mm -hmm. um, well, because it's so. Because the cool part about ET, because it's so like, it's so relatable. You know, like it's like they turned it. They turned basically an an invader alien movie into a kid's movie. Well, I want you, you know, to look, look at the beast master, which I don't even know if I've seen, but look at the, beast, be, look at the beast masters cover art in Conan. It's like the exact same stuff. Oh yeah. I see. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so what I meant by like the eighties being like kind of, um, the eighties became like a thing where, uh, these type of, like Highlander is another movie and Excalibur is another movie. Uh, I think Excalibur was made in 81. Um, it's a darker version of, um, yeah, it was made in 81. It was a darker version of like the King Arthur legend. And a lot of people that are, um, a lot of people that are, that are right wing like it. I, it's pretty good. It, um, but, I only draw attention to it before we get into Conan. Just 
just for the simple fact that it was um that it's just something that like it, it has a fantasy element right you got to remember this is not you know the lord of the rings in the 2000s hadn't come out mm-hmm. and so you you have this like pretty artsy film that's really cool called excalibur and in the year before you have kind of b-movie tier stuff like um like the highlander uh with you know with even sean connery um there's just different things at this level man that just get ridiculous and they're funny i mean they're fun and they're action-packed and they're adventure and they're set in a time that's like not really a precise historical time um the last type of like um nerd you know nerd tier stuff i want to say about contextualizing conan is that if you google hyperborea hyperborea is h-y-b-o-r-i-a and it's it's a made-up place and world that the author robert e howard created and what he set conan in and what you got yeah, and just like what well, you gotta, so just to draw attention to the fact that you know, this is not supposed to be like you know, show me on the the map where where this place is at, or you know, it's just it's fantasy, right? And they call it um, sword and sorcery, you know, um, particularly. And anyway, this is the the kind of milieu that um, Conan is set in. Another way of thinking of it is, oftentimes I think of it as it's like pre-civilizational in a lot of ways but there's elements of things that are going on that you would probably only see in the iron age you know i mean at least the bronze age of civilization like assyria and um these like really really old civilizations like the you know like the egyptian civilization or whatever but it's like it, it's even better i think and sometimes to think of it as mesolithic so you have like the stone age, the stone age or the paleolithic then you have the mesolithic then you have the neolithic where agriculture is developed okay so not to geek out too much but i kind of get the feeling like agriculture is not a big thing right no for, it for seems me. it seems like they're still nomadic yes exactly and so this is what i mean so it plays with these fantastical themes and ideas and places and it's kind of ambiguous where it's at yeah you know and that's that's kind of the thing i really like about 80s movies though there's <laughs> a lot of ambiguity there's not a whole lot of explanation they could just kind of go for the jugular i mean like before <laughs> you you had like in the like the 60s and the 70s where you don't know you didn't know what you were getting but like let's take for it, like let's take uh star wars or like star trek for example like you had like the fantasy world's kind of built kind of, you know, already there and you got a kind of a feel for what's going on and who the characters were and stuff. There's some eighties movies that they just, you know, it's just flat out right into it. And I mean, it's kind of like Arnie style though, of his style of movie though, too. And, and this is good. This is going to bother me. So Zap Brannigan is from Futurama. He's like the strong man from the captain strong man from Futurama but he's he's kind of a wuss, and then Rainier Wolfcastle from from uh, The Simpsons. I knew I knew it was something, and he plays he plays like a detective. McBain is like one of the series that's you know the sub series that's on, um, that's on The Simpsons. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. But yeah. like his like the archetypes, you know, for for Arnie is there. You know, it's kind of cool on how like he's he's the he's the guy that's the action hero guy. But before that, you know, I mean, it was a guy like Bruce Lee. Like if you pick up like almost any video game or like martial arts video game or fighting game, they're gonna have like a Bruce Lee, you know, like like prototype or well clone, I guess. You know, and kind of the same thing with us. You know, we're just always used to that like the masculine, you know, big guy probably with the with the foreign accent you know taking just taking care of business i mean for god's sakes when when arnie came back as the terminator and terminator 2 they were like oh yeah you need to dial down the austrian you know they were they were like yeah it's cool or the you know the the uh what was he a t t1000 and and the t1000 model 
can come back with uh you know with a heavy with a heavy Austrian accent. It's like you know, did did those machines yeah. even know Austria existed? Yeah. yeah, it's like I mean there's there's a lot of stuff that we could get into with like how Arnold got to where he got, you know, yeah. um but the, the important thing to remember about this movie is that, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't really a big blockbuster movie, man. And, you know, and, it, and it, you can kind of – people will make fun of me, like, about, like, saying it's a B movie or whatever. The thing is, it wasn't a B movie. You know, it wasn't a B movie. Like, people think that Terminator's a B movie. It, I don't want to get too far in the, far in the weeds about this, but – yeah, okay. I just want to put it. I want to put it in context just a little bit. Like, they spent twenty million dollars on this on this film in nineteen eighty. They were filming it, okay, in the early early eighties, right? So twenty million dollars is not nothing. It's not. It's not a low budget B movie. No, no, no. Like, and it made money. You know, it tripled its its. So it was a hit, but it definitely became way more of a hit throughout time and that is because uh, probably because um you know the popularity of arnold grew and grew over time throughout the decade of the 80s mm -hmm. and so anyway and it really and i think arnold was like in the he was like in the, the pinnacle of his of his stardom as an actor probably in the early 90s so like 10 years later mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think that's one thing to keep in mind. And the unfortunate thing is, you know, we may or may not do the Conan the Destroyer and compare it because it's it's so, like, not as good that I kind of get, you know, weirded out about it. I mean, it's, it's not – I'm not going to say – I'm not going to say it's not worth watching, but, like, I just – for the purposes of this podcast, we're not going to talk about it that much um, just because we could stay on target with this one. But – um. You know, it, there's no doubt about it. Okay, they this film that we're talking about became a cult film, and it is a cult film. You know, okay. I think I think people are, I think I guess the younger the people are, the less likely they are to care about it. It's kind of sad, but um, you know, this is just how things are, I guess. But um, you know, I because of, I mean, I guess you could speak on it a little bit better than me. I mean, do you think? I mean, I don't really play. I, I had I didn't play video games that much, um, but I mean, it, it, you're more kind of aware of the meme culture and stuff like that um, than I am in, in in video games than I am. I mean, like, what, what, since you just watched this, like, what do you think? Like a twenty, let's say a twenty two year old, I pluck a twenty two year old man, you know, young man off the street, uh, is he going to know? anything about conan what is he going to think about conan is he just going to see like an image of arnold being jacked swinging a sword and that's about it yeah, i mean that's pretty much what i got out of it but okay yeah um but there was also to go along with um to go along with i guess the conan type of lore you had uh he-man you know masters of the universe yes exactly had, thank you you had conan um you had the animated series. There was okay. Conan the animated series. Okay. I remember that as a kid for sure. Um, what was that thing? I'm gonna pause it if I can't think of it. If we can't think of it, but like, what was that show that like Xena the Warrior Princess or something like that? It's some yep. awful. <laughs> it kind of you can tell that this influenced that. No doubt. Oh yeah, because there know, was think, uh, Kevin Sorbo played Conan the Barbarian in a live action series. Yeah, so I mean, this is a thing, you know. It's not now. How like I mean, I, I, it's probably more of a thing for me than um, I don't know. Like I, I like I could do. I mean, if I'm being honest, I could do like I would love to talk about Total Recall, Running Man, and Commando and Predator. I would love to just do every single one of those things and just get crazy. But like I, like, and then I'll, I'll 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 come off as the biggest Arnold fanboy ever. But I don't want to I don't want to reach epic proportions like that. Yet. But, uh, like, but anyway, I'm very appreciative that you uh, came on to talk about this because I want to talk about because I want to talk about. So I I figured you would, 
I figured you would at least when you watched it, you would, you, you can't, I can't get you to feel like I felt when I was a kid. Right. Like I can't, yeah, but it's like, maybe I think as a, as a father and as just someone that like, and, and you knowing you, you know, we're friends and I figured you would like it. And I, I don't think I was wrong. Like you liked it. I did like it. Yeah. I did like it. And as a, like, if I watch that, and 22 year old shoes oh yeah i would have loved that <laughs> or like how about 15 it. or 14 or 12 or well i mean you know Maybe it's a little... <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but, it's not it's not yeah i'm not gonna let what do you think is a good age because i'm about yeah well i don't want to say it. if i'm gonna have if i have kids like um what do you think do you think i don't know what do you think the right age is for this 14 uh, 14 Something like 13, maybe? I mean, if you're trying to be... Oh, wow. Dang. I was going to say above 18. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. JP's a, a better person than me, people. Uh, so, um, <laughs> basically, the bottom line. But, um, so, anyway, like, yeah. like So, I'll meet you somewhere in the middle. I'll, I'll wait till he's 13. <laughs> oh, there you <laughs> so, go. But I was probably, like, freaking eight. Um, um, but, I mean, as... When you're that young too, I mean, you kind of understand what's going on, but then again, you don't because you're yeah. like you're more so enthralled with like the fantasy stuff, like yeah, that, that scene with the uh with that succubus. I was like, <laughs> as as a man, you're kind of like, what? Why is he? What is? Why is he even messing around with that? And then, yeah, and then all of a sudden, it comes yeah, there's some good, nowhere, there's some like, there's some Whoa. things that are yeah, there's some things that are definitely inappropriate for an eight year old. That's for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. Uh, whoops. Oops. <laughs> but, uh, but I love, you know, my dad's probably never going to listen to this, but uh, dad, I love you. Um, I don't, you know, whatever. It turned out all right. So yeah. you're okay. So you're okay, dad. But, um, yeah, it, it is. It, but I mean, okay. So it's like, you know, um, <laughs> that's um, good. You know, it's like I, I I believe in God. I'm a Christian, and I'm I'm okay. I'm okay. I think, but but, but like but like that's guy humor right there too. That's why they can't make these movies. That's anymore, what I mean. People don't understand that. You know, like like yeah. like we're like, oh yeah, it's a pair of boobs. But then again, like as as like even a young guy, you're kind of like you kind you, you, you guys kind of kind of like both look at each other and go, eh. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, all right, we're, we're cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, thanks for saying that. Just, like, like, you made, like let, made me feel better a little bit. Uh, but the thing is, uh, so, like, I don't know, man. Like, let me let me just, like, go over the, 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 the real bare bones plot, and then we'll get in, we'll get into what, what we like about it and, and what we thought about it. Um, So, I mean, essentially, you got this. You got this, you know, it starts off with him being a kid and his father is talking about, um, you know, crumb, crumb, and like the power. Oh, you, know. oh, you ever see uh, Real Monsters from uh, Nickel and uh, Nickelodeon? No, but is it wrong? Oh, it? it was the, it was this, there was this fat, there's this fat monster that holds his eyeballs and his name is Crumb. Oh, <laughs> and man. I right off the bat, I was That's like, hilarious. I laughed. I just, yeah. <laughs> So his dad is like telling them about like you know how steel and you see this theme throughout like the power of steel and it makes sense in the in the in the way that if you go back to like what I said about it being kind of in this pre civilizational era and you have to think remember like how the Bronze Age is basically called that because they had bronze and the Iron Age is because they have iron right and so it's kind of getting you in that. And that, because how awesome it would be if you had metallurgy to a sense that where you could have iron weapons and then steel instead of bronze weapons, right? And like Berger would have been a perfect person to spurg out about this because he's way more into the uh, he's way he's way more steeped in in this early European Indo-European um, history. Um, but suffice it to say. Um, you know, this is kind of will help kind of contextualize it, like why his father would be kind of obsessed with that, right? And so, because it, to have a steel weapon is is going to put you above like the run of the mill people, like they're going to be running around with 
they're going to be running around with bronze weapons and iron weapons, but they're not going to be running around with steel weapons. It's going to be very rare. And, and so that's where the story kind of kicks off. And very quickly it escalates to where this marauding troop of, so of people of warriors basically come up and rape and pillage the, the, um, the, the village and that that Conan young Conan is a kid and and he you know loses his family and then he gets enslaved right and and then it it goes from him being enslaved to like being auctioned off as like a fighter in like pit fights and he learns like the way of the sword and he learns how to be like an awesome warrior um, that's fighting basically for the amusements of people that are placing bets on these type of fights. And it's like kind of like proto gladiatorial combat. And, and from there, you know, uh, he, he, his master gives him his freedom. And then, you know, essentially the story unfolds from there where he meets, he meets some of these, there's only really, um, there's only really a couple of characters, you know, um, if you think about it, like, right, like you're thinking about Conan himself, uh, you're thinking about his buddy that he runs into, Subatai, who was, funny enough, was a real, that name is like, he was one of Genghis Khan's generals, this great commander called Subatai, because it's a play on that, who was played by uh, Jerry Lopez, very well, I think, and um, you have Valeria, a female character that comes along and this kind of this group of you know you have conan and subatai and valeria and they are going to you know basically be uh wanderlust warriors that do their own thing and to me the essentially the story there's very and we'll get into it later but there's there's the hero's journey is in this story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just a basic Joseph Campbell hero's journey where, you know, the, the hero, the protagonist is, you know, is thrust into uh, an adventure. And, but I mean, there's so many motifs throughout mm -hmm. it. You know, you, you even have like him basically dying uh, yeah, and point, and resurrecting, and it. resurrecting, and I know that that could get really, yeah. you know, uh, kind of rub people the wrong way in a certain sense. But if you, well, it's take... kind of cool too because of like the there was a definite. I, I mean, I got like glad I got definite like gladiator vibes with it, um, especially with the combat, people betting on him and him like you know getting to the status of the fact that he didn't have to be in combat anymore. Yeah. Um. Where, whereas, you know, obviously, the uh, you know, he came from nothing. Whereas in Gladiator, obviously, Russell Crowe's character came he was from a general. Something. Yeah, he was yeah. a general. Yeah. Um. It was because you know it was kind of flip flopped in that sense, but still, you know, I mean, you still very heroes, yeah. heroes type of journey, and still, tra I mean, both stories were still tragic. Yes, um, and also, dude. But the thing is, like, he he, it was like, um. You have like, you know, in, he he has you know um, what James Earl Jones is called Thulsa Doom. I oh mean, yeah, Casa Doom. <laughs> and you and you, and you have, um, you know, you have uh, the when he. I didn't even realize this until today, and I've seen this movie so many times. I thought about it like how when Conan is killed you know i'm jumping every which way now but like when he when he basically looks like he's dead and the the wizard character um uh he you know lets him he does magic essentially and and, and makes a bargain with the gods and and he says like they're gonna they're gonna want something to pay for it and all this stuff uh if you watch game of thrones this exact same motif is played out with um, Khaleesi's husband, um, Cole Drogo, who was played by um, Jason Momoa in the later rendition of Conan in like 2011. But anyway, in Game oh yeah, okay. But in Game of Thrones, man, 
uh, the character called Drogo is is killed and 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 brought back to life, but he's like dead essentially. He doesn't. He's just like zombified. He's not who. He has nothing to him. He's not really like brought back in the sense of like psychologically the same person. But it's obvious that J.R.R. Martin, the creator of Game of Thrones, was definitely using this uh, precisely in in that part of the story of Game of Thrones. Um, and essentially, you know, the plot is like I said, the hero's journey in a, in a basic sense, but also it's very much about revenge. It really, you know, like because Conan the Barbarian loses his parents, it's also doom, and he, you know, the end result of it, of the whole story is him getting his revenge. Now, of course, a lot of things happen throughout the story that, you know, for I also thought for like a two hour movie, it was pretty, it was paced pretty well. There wasn't a lot of lag or a lot of down, you know, to it. Yeah, they really, yeah. I, I thought it was, I did think it was well paced too. I didn't think it was over the top, cheesy, or, yeah. you know, completely, completely like, terrible. So it wasn't like slow, very slow yeah. aspects to it at all. Like it, there's scenes where they're like, you know, things that aren't, hugely important to the to the overall story but i mean it, it it's trying to recreate essentially like a sort of like i said sort of sorcery pulp um it's kind of, it's trying to like merge all of of robert e howard's motifs and mixing in some other stuff in there and 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 gi- giving you a movie and the movie wasn't made necessarily with the thought of having a sequel or anything like that and I think that's obvious when you get to the end of it in the in the credits roll and you see like what happened to Conan and what became of him. But um, you know, it was kinda like one and done, you know. But mm-hmm. um so I thought that like, okay, let's get into it. Like um let's go with this, like let's start with like the what did you think that what what about it did you not like? Let's do that a little bit, you know. Is there <laughs> like let's get that over with like and then we'll get it because i usually don't talk about things i don't like i usually yeah. talk about things i like <laughs> but i mean let's like get into it a little bit i mean i'm sure there's some things that might have i don't know if they rubbed you the wrong way or just the story uh some type of anything you know i don't know I, the the acting obviously yeah. cheesy yeah kind of over the That's top why the b movie just, aspect of yeah. it you know like yeah. in in the in the special effects are definitely well i mean it was the 80s yeah so, i mean i didn't expect you know i don't expect but but whatever i mean special effects eh, like yeah. whatever i mean you can you can do like you can do more with physical effects and stuff too i mean like they pulled off to i mean look at how they pulled off jurassic park and those that was all all mostly physical effects yeah i mean i think so, like, jurassic park has great repel replay value yeah so I mean, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not the type to get you know too hung up on special effects and it. You know, yeah. If they're if they're outright cheesy, yeah. Then I'm gonna then I'm gonna laugh my I'm gonna laugh my ass off. But you know, I mean, for an '80s movie, not bad. Yeah, not bad. Okay. Um, but seldom, you know, seldom were they used and stuff. I guess. I guess. I mean. The, the, the snake special part, effects. This, this, when they killed that. Oh video. yeah, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, but, but, uh, like, I guess I would lend the more of the special effects to like the combat and the bleeding and stuff, you know, like they did a good job of that. Like it wasn't overtly terrible. Um, yeah. And the acting was, the acting was, well, obviously. Um, but this, one of the stranger things and kind of one of the things that, that kind of threw me off. Yeah. I really didn't like was the, uh, the wizard. In his like voiceover or what whatever was going on with his voice, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that guy I don't like that guy. He could, yeah, man, you know, he take or leave him. What did yeah. you think about? What did you think about like, um, I, like Valeria or uh, Subatai, his friend, or his love Subi- interest? Uh, Subatai was good. Yeah, I thought Valeria it was, good. was uh, I don't know. I thought she was okay. Just kind of like 
add-on character. You yeah, know? they were kind of like, well, we need we need we need to ha- we need to give uh, Conan some depth, so he's not just this killing machine. <laughs> yeah, so we need her. Yeah, um, you I know, agree. And I, and I thought the movie would have whatever. I mean, I don't think I don't think she. Oh, well, she kind of she added value to it, but yeah. eh. It's just kind of like it, it, she, it is what it is to use a you know, phrase. Yeah. Um, um, I agree. Uh, and it, it well, um, I guess, uh, when I think about like the kind of an interesting scene is, you know, they basically have when, when they decide to kind of. Like, okay, you have these three people. You have Conan, you have Subutai, you have Valeria. And they are, you know, I'll get into like, okay, well, how do they even meet Valeria? It's like Conan and Subutai. Well, Conan, you know, uh, Subutai, he comes across Subutai and he, he frees he frees Subutai. You know, and that's kind of like Subutai, the guy is like, they're um, chained up. You know, he's going to die he's like starving you know and and conan comes across him and they kind of have this cheeky moment where you know he's like you know i I can use some food basically and and conan's like okay you know you don't know what he's going to say what he's going to do about it and he he kind of just decides like then there to free him and they could they become buddies you know and it becomes kind of a buddy thing um in a lot of ways um and I, when they, they they decide that they're gonna they're gonna like because the stupid guy says he's a thief, you know, and that's kind of more or less why he's in trouble, why he was like chained up or and left to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he frees them, they decide like, okay, well, let's go make some money. Let's let's get into this. Like, I guess it's like almost like a temple or something, you know. I it and they're going to go in there and and they run across Valeria the the chick with blonde hair and she's like she's a thief too and she's like they they literally like bump into each other while they're both trying to rob the place that they're going to yeah. go into it's like yeah. oh shit and that's a very Robert E Howard pulp fiction Conan you know novel type of thing like something like that would happen in one of his stories. So I thought that was kind of funny. And they decide like, you know, she's like, look, like you're not going to get, you're not going to basically be able to do what you think you're going to do. Uh, and I can help you. And so she makes herself valuable in that sense. And that's kind of how the, the friendship is uh, born between the three of them. And in, you know, I mean, it's like the, that's the 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 kind of you have this very ominous ominous like overtones like i remember as a kid like that's one of the differences that i would have that i don't really get as an adult is like kind of being scared of like there's this the snakes and everything and oh yeah it's cult and yeah you know, it's very like bizarre you know it's really weird um well but- did you see how like some some how well and then you could you could even put this like kind of towards politics and stuff like on how like there were those small societies that conan was in the nomadic society um and then you kind of had like your your different like ca- caste systems in a way where you know uh the snake cult that What's it? Oh shoot! What's it? Uh, James Earl Jones's character was trying to spread, yeah, and he was trying to be the you know he's trying to be like the empire about it, and then and then you had the um the wizards who were against it, like Conan's wizard, yeah, um, you know, and, and by like, the way, it's like that had never even given a name, basically. No, I know yeah. he's just the, that wizard. He's like mm-hmm. a wizard guy. Conan said you were a wizard, so. Do That's your thing, right. otherwise I'll kill, otherwise I'll kill you or something. What yeah. uh, what Valeria said to him, um, but but it's kind of strange because like there's like a obviously there's a power struggle between uh 
what's his name? Kelly Carador. I can't. Um, James Earl Jones's character. Yeah, Thalsa Doom. Thalsa Doom. Yeah. There's there's a power struggle between him and the gods. Um, yeah. Like he's he's like kind of you know trying to rub it in their face, and he's you know vying for power over humanity because of well, basically the the dude can turn into a snake. But yeah, but you know he's got he's got the whole that whole snake cult thing behind him, which is which if you think about it too, that's that's totally symbolic because oh yeah, he was, he's he's the serpent king and he's defying the gods. So I mean, and they, they probably they kind of play like with um when Conan talks to Sh- Subutai about like what gods do you pray to, and it's funny like um uh, God uh, I mean um Conan goes crumb and and he, you know. Um, and he's he's kind of like Conan's kind of flipping about it throughout, but he he does yeah. always kind of he always kind of goes back to that. But Subutai's like, I play to the the four winds. My god is a sky god. Your god lives underneath him. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you see, like, okay, there's this vying for uh, mythological and um. Uh, spiritual, if you want to call it that, um, type of uh, worldviews at play, but uh, it's clear it's clear that also that Thulsa Doom has kind of there's like a dark cloud over his area of control. It's and it and it also has like this weird, like I almost like you can tell like when John Milius was making this movie he was in a lot of ways reacting against hippie culture, right? Because the cult has, the snake cult has very much, it looks like these girls are, that's what, in, yeah, you know, that's are, what it is. The hippie. Yeah. That's what like they're they're walking all, around, like, you know, like free love and yeah. weird, you know, um, yeah, robes and lackadaisical, like what are they doing? You know, they're just kind of um, being. They're you don't you're not really sure why they're even doing. The followers are doing what they're doing, and they're kind of like NPCs. You know, like uh, kind, they yeah brainwashed yeah. to the poison or the venom. Uh, yeah. You yeah. know, his character is given out, and I think that you know it's. It, it, so I think that that's a little bit of what's going on, you know, with the director and the writers that are putting together the story is that they're trying, he's trying to show you like the kind of dark overtones that some of these hippie communes um, that we can kind of meme about now, but back in the early eighties, they were just, re- you know, people would have just went through the seventies and the seventies was filled with counterculture, free love, that type of thing, mm-hmm. you know, in, in a way, I think it's, it, to me, it seemed like that was what it was. It, it was playing in the background of, of what was going on. Like, it's like, yeah, this is a, a pre-civilizational period and it, there's warriors and people are, you know, at the mercy of this tyrannical cult leader, Thulsa Doom, but there's all, it's not all it cracks up to be just like in a lot of ways often communes are very kind of demonic and 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 weird it's always like the cult leader is sleeping with everybody's wife and something really you know if not satanic um quasi satanic is going on you know what i mean like it and so definitely had those vibes to it where he was or he was well i mean you could even call it you could even call it jim jones like i mean he was trapped i mean James yeah. Earl Jones. That's funny. yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. no, exactly. Uh, it's good that you brought that up because I mean, I've kind of been like I've listened to um, Daryl Cooper's podcast, Martyr Made on. Uh, he has a whole series on Jim Jones and the seven. Oh wow, really? Yeah, it's really good. Um, that is pretty it, cool. And he gets all into like the cultural milieu of the seventies in America, and in in any way, like it it. It, yeah, Jim Jones gets these people to poison themselves, obviously. Yep. At the end, and what is Thulsa Doom doing? Like, he he's seems basically to be- getting people to poison themselves. And <laughs> then I thought, I thought that was really interesting because he goes, 
well, you know the riddle about the steel, boy. But yes. do you know what's stronger than steel? Flesh. Flesh. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man, that is straight out of, like, something from the Bible. Like, that is, like, yeah. straight out of, like, a parable, you know, that, like, uh, well, I mean, the devil would say, I mean, that's that's basically carnal, carnal desire, carnal desire and carnal temptation. And he, ba I mean, he makes that girl fall to her death. And yeah. I mean, him having that kind of control, you know, obviously cultish behavior, you know, people do things for their supposed leader. And, and, but the, but the other part is too, is like, he had control in a sense, but then he didn't because in a way, like there was always fear in his, in his eyes too, whenever he saw Conan. Yeah. So you could tell he was definitely afraid of his courage. And mm -hmm. I guess, I, I mean, I wouldn't call Conan like an overtly virtuous character, but, yeah. But he's masculine. He's 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 courageous. He's brave for but sure. But that's just it. Those are virtues. Being courageous and brave are definitely virtues. And he was obviously full of vengeance because of his parents. But that one scene where they brought in the girl for him to do his thing with, yeah, and he didn't treat like that girl. You notice how scared she was of him. Well. Yeah. She didn't, you know, he really didn't show, like, that he, you know, that he was a bad person and that, and, like, you know, that kind of, that kind of, that does show character and that does show that, you know, at least he has, he's not, he's not an absolute savage. So, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I guess that's, that's the, that's a redeeming quality. That's a virtuous quality that he had in, in the movie. But, you know, and, and, um, the other thing is too, is like, the death of his parents is like, what, what a motivational factor! Like, oh, holy crap! Like, that was the whole underpinning of the movie and the whole motivation behind him trying to get to James. You know, our gosh, Thulsa Doom. Thulsa Doom. That was trying to get to like you know a Thulsa Doom. That that was his whole mo and. That's probably why, because, because you know, Thalsa Doom was acting on false, well, pre, on false pretenses, whereas you have the flip side, Arnie's character, Co Conan, was acting on, well, I mean, for that, <laughs> for, for the, for the, you know, for the story that it is, I guess you could call it noble, circ you know, uh, noble circumstances. Because he was basically, I mean, doing something that was probably natural for any, you know, young man or woman to, somebody killed my parents. Uh, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to chop yeah. their head off, you know, I want to kill them, you know. I mean, it's kind of a natural, you know, yeah. thing, thing to think. Thing well, to yeah, yeah, that's what I think, like it speaks to kind of like how you told me like basically this movie can never be made today and you're right i mean um because it plays on i, I guess the best word for it is masculine traits you know that uh, thinking that is just you know over and over again about you know okay well um conan is is thrust into this adventure and he has to use his own kind of self-reliance and and the discipline that he learned through combat and repeated, you know, one-on-one -on -one fighting uh, that it, it, it kind of montages over. But um, yeah, he, he, typical and, '80s, right there. <laughs> yeah, Time it's like for a, a montage. <laughs> Yeah, it's like very reminiscent of like Rocky or something. You know, when training. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> um, which is funny because I, it came. It, it's like that was all in the in the kind of milieu of of late seventies, early eighties movies, uh, for sure. And I mean, and it's why, like, you know, without being overtly political, the the, the theme of masculinity just plays throughout it and it's like it has become 
kind of a political thing now because you you're kind of I guess the warrior ethos and uh, things like honor, things like um, duty, justice. Du- yeah. Uh, well, I mean, warriors have to go through hardships, but if they're fighting for a just cause you know, they can repent and they can become better people. So, I mean, it's comp, obviously every, a lot of things are complicated um, and nothing can probably be more complicated than being a warrior, but, you know, kind of in a sense, they're kind of pawns too with all the, you know, politicians and warlords taking advantage of them. Um, Yeah. And it's like Conan, Conan is like not going to take it. Basically, it's yeah. like the guy that's just not going to, yeah, live and let live, or or um, not live and let live, but like he's not going to abide by oppression or dishonor or um, you know, that's and then I think that like a lot of people today, um, you, know, you want to see somebody take action and you know, control, control their destiny, so to speak. And that's why, you know, a a story like Conan the Barbarian is, I guess, you know, a a kind of perennial motif. I mean, it's not gonna, whatever your, whatever your worldview is or your disposition is to violence and, you know, standing up for yourself and when to, when to kind of take the law in your own hand and all this all that kind of goes out the window with a story like Conan because it's in a period of time when there is no real law and order in any sense that we think of it. So you can kind of uh, understand why he's doing what he's doing. And it, well, it, you know, it appeals to people, like you are saying. Like it, it speaks to how we, we find ourselves in situations where you might know what to do or what you think is the right thing to do. And, and you might want to stand up for yourself, but very often we just don't, we just can't, or we feel like we can't, you know? Well, and then if you think about it, what is like, what's an outlaw, you know, somebody who lives outside the law, but yet they're yeah. probably just a self-reliant, you know, they do, they, they might do things crappy, crap. They might do crappy things to other people, but you know, I mean, or they might be great, you know, great people, but the, well, I mean, the word outlaw is probably so kind of, kind of strange now because it's like, you know, meme trolls on the internet as compared to masculine men in the mid to late 1800s of the United States who were gruff, tough, self-reliant, um, you know, and probably... I'm sure, you know, some of them were probably had great relationships with the sheriff. Some of them probably not. But if you think about, like, those kind of, that, you know, that kind of, like, rugged individualism, rugged, indivi- you know, rugged masculinity, like, yeah, for, for men to take action and take it upon themselves, I mean, in a sense, everybody's got, I, well, I think America kind of embraces the whole outlaw spirit the best. But this is kind of neat too. This is gonna this is gonna be a a rug that ties the room together. <laughs> um, but the Mongols, the Mongols, and the Mon- the Mongolian influence in Conan was huge. And yeah, talk which- about a culture that is like kind of outlawish, you know, rugged. Obviously, yeah, bad- pastoral ass, people definitely. <laughs> yeah, pastoral people that. Are outside so-called civilization, outside yeah. settlement, you know, settled society. Yeah, exactly. And, Noble yeah, savages. That's but probably they have their own culture. They have they have their own, you know, they have their own teachings that are very distinct from, well, distinct from different Asian cultures. But yet, at the same time, they kind of they kind of have their the same kind of you know Asian culture ethos in a sense because you know honor is very you know very strong. Yeah, that was them. probably Community, one of the one of the things that is not as much played upon like the original uh, Conan stories uh, back in the 1930s um, with Robert E. Howard's renditions of them versus this movie is that you, the kind of Asian or Asiatic um, 
overtones to it. I mean, even Conan himself is when he learns from like a, a he gets past the pit fighting and he kind of gets more and more uh, honed and and um, taught how to be like a very um, uh, highly skilled uh, swordsman. It's like he's learning from an obvious uh, Asian uh, teacher there a little bit in, in one of the scenes and um you know that that's kind of like you get some of the you get the like the Nietzsche quote like whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger yeah um, right off that, the bat too I was yeah. like yeah I'm gonna like this movie <laughs> the, the movie like is playing with that throughout um but it's also like it's throwing in Western stuff with Eastern stuff. And I think that kind of mashup is what probably is unique about the film versus if you just read the Pulp Fiction novels. Um, and, it, it, and it kind of, it, it makes sense in a kind of weird way. Uh, I think it works, you know, in the movie um, pulling those together because even geographically, like it, uh, if you had where like Central Europe and Eastern Europe meets the steppe of Asia, you know, the plains mm -hmm. of Asia, um, you kind of get that kind of mixture of Asian culture. Like we're talking about Mongolians or steppe warriors or nomadic horsemen, yeah. and, you know, and, and the, the, also the Western kind of, I guess the, the people, I mean, that's kind of the thing. The funny thing is like, you see like a complete, um, mixture of different cultures in conan you don't just see yeah it's, not, it's clear that it's not like england or france or germany you know you're yeah, it's out not just a flat out like european power yeah mm -hmm. yeah exactly and so that, that's that's in there um as well and i guess like one of the things that um it's like the kind of, um, I guess, um, back and forth of like, okay, Conan's kind of distrust for wizardry and magic and the gods, all of it together. You even got a little bit of it earlier on with that kind of bizarre scene where he's with, he comes across like a woman that's like I, we don't know as a witch, but later it becomes like obvious that she's a witch and like possessed. Remember like the scene where yeah, that was he wild. Throws her into the fire or something, and she's like possessed. And then her soul like comes yeah. gets away from her, comes out of her body, and she's like her spirit screams throughout. And yeah, that was that was kind of that was nuts. Like. And then it's like, dude, as a, as a fellow dude, why are you, why are you shacking up? <laughs> get out. You must, you must get out now. Get to the chopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like seriously, like, what are you doing, bro? We, we yeah. know you're a barbarian, but sometimes you don't need to go full barbarian. <laughs> yeah. So he kind of learns his lesson with wizards. And so it's kind of funny how. Or witches and that too, yeah, 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 and and that's where like, but then it's played on with the the wizard that helps him out, you know, the guy that's more Asian looking, and uh, you know, obviously, um, and he's the narrator of of the movie as well. Um, so you, you know, it, it's interesting. I guess uh, I was going to jump to a scene where um, I thought it was. It's about halfway through the movie where um, you have the, the trio of Conan and Supertai and Valeria and they 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 kind of get – they're like partying and they're drinking because they've had money that they stole. Mm -hmm. And, and um, they kind of get you know uh, apprehended, arrested essentially, and taken before an actual king, King Osric. And you're kind of like, okay, everything's moving so fast. Like – at that point, like, okay, what's going to happen? Like, I kind of didn't think that he, that they were going to die or anything because it's just like, it's the middle of the movie, but this is kind of a twist to it that could, could be easily glossed over, but I don't think it should be is, um, you know, the King gets him, 
you know, because he knows who these these people are, this trio of of basically thieves and warriors. And he's like, look, um, uh, I want you to go rescue my daughter. And this is really where the hero's journey becomes something for real because uh, King Osric is like an older king who is missing his daughter. And he's basically essentially bribing and begging them to kind of try to go rescue his daughter from Thalsa Doom, who had, you know, in his words, essentially uh, lured her into his cult and has a spell over her or whatever, you know, and, yeah. and he, he's like bribing them, like, look at all these rubies. He like throws them on the ground and they're like seeing all these riches. He's like, you'll have enough money to be kings yourself, you know? And he, and to him, it shows, you know, uh, King, King Osric. Os Osric shows that, like, yeah, he has all these riches. He's a king, but nothing means more to him than his daughter's love. You know, and that shows exactly. a, that shows a lot of humanity right there. That shows a lot of his humility, his humanity. You know, which you don't really necessarily you're not you're not expecting something like that in the beginning when you walk yeah. up to that point, which makes it more than like when I ask like, you know, what is something what is something about it that's good and true? Well, that is, you know, and for me, I mean, and I thought, and I'm probably speaking for you too. I mean, it's like, well, there's these like glimmers of virtue that th shines kind of throughout the movie, like that you don't expect. And yeah, that, that definitely caught me by surprise because he's like, like he, he's never forgetting his duty as a parent, you know, and as obviously as a parent of privilege to, you know, help his daughter out. Cause he has the means to do it yeah you know and you know he's probably hoping that you know they come back with with her and then he also said something pretty interesting too he's like my my throne room has become my own prison too and i'm like huh yeah how uh how like how how strange of you to say that because it's like in a way you know i feel like that's how a lot of conversations about monarchy can go too because it's like yeah sure these things can be all well and good but you can definitely have a king who, you know, basically is inept or overtly tyrannical. And, you know, I mean, in a way like that, the whole the whole I have to save my daughter as a just king kind of thing definitely took me by surprise. Yeah, it was, it was a cool scene. And, um, and basically uh, and they're trying to um, they 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 don't really want to do it, but they they're willing to do it for the money, obviously. And they they kind of like they're like, look, like we don't need to go in there and get your revenge, Conan. We just get her and get out, and we'll get your revenge later. You know, yeah, um, that type of scenario. And Conan doesn't really even say like that he agrees. He actually doesn't say anything because <laughs> he's just kind of like thinking like probably like well you know maybe you know like we'll see uh, yeah um and i mean it it's interesting that like um apparently uh arnold for the role like he's normally at that point in his life was like walking around at 240 pounds but he slimmed down to 210 uh because he was like uh doing a lot of horseback riding and um just uh, trying to uh, be, I don't know, uh, like more fit in a way, like for, you know, endurance, stamina, stuff like that, uh, which is funny to think of him slimming down mm -hmm. uh, for the role. But he, because he's coming off of like being Mr. Universe and still jacked to the gills. Um, and the guy, Jerry Lopez, who plays Subutai, uh, I didn't know this, but he, He's in another one of Milius's movies that I think is pretty good called Big Wednesday. It's a surfing movie of all things, which is really bizarre that and kind of cool. And one of the reasons why I like Milius, the director, is because he he did uh, Apocalypse Now, uh, the script. He did okay. uh, Red Dawn, and he did yeah. Conan. You know, and he did this surfing movie. And Jerry Lopez, the guy that plays Subutai, apparently was in the surfing movie, and he was even a surfer. Um, so the fact that like the guy you know is moving around and very agile and kind of 
athletic makes sense. You know, it's like, okay, at least you got somebody in there that is, you know, not like completely uh, just an actor. Like he's an athlete too. Well, it's kind of funny because he had Conan who was like the big Hulk Polish type. Whereas, uh, oh shoot. The other kid, what do you say? The other character's name? Subatai. Yeah. Who's kind of like cat, like agile, aloof, yeah. You know, he's he's like the guy that can go and sneak in and yes. nobody would know he was there. And then I don't know, uh Valeria, what? she was kind of, kind of in the type. middle. Yeah. Yeah, she's like a very tomboy, but you know, obviously feminine character in the same time, but also uh fully capable of wielding swords and killing people. <laughs> um uh yeah, man, and, and like so, when they agree on that, it's like okay, we're gonna do this thing. That's like obviously super dangerous and everything, but um, yeah, uh, they're gonna get it done, and they they that's that kind of gets us into the scene where they go back into this kind of I don't know, it's like what would you call it? like sub subterranean, um, like it's under a cavern or something, you know, and it's like this elaborate palace under the earth essentially um yeah and, and they're all like doing their like cult thing like it's like there's women and men fornicating and doing whatever <laughs> and they're like have that big cauldron of which is like green gross whatever but it actually has human like, gunk yeah. venom yeah so they're like eating Dude. that you remember the uh, the scene in uh, three hundred where Xerxes tempted that one deformed yes. guy? Is that the kind of feeling you got from it? Yeah, yeah, that's the same. Yep, where you'll have riches you can't even imagine. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the vibe I got. Yeah, that's true. That's funny. Um, and when they they go into this thing, they they're kind of they get all like uh painted up like they got like black paint on them like they're going war paint yeah sneak ninja action right um and they just go in there and they're trying to look for the princess who's under that spell and you know she is like clearly like under like some type of hypnosis or whatever and this is where we see thalsa doom turn into a snake you know uh and you're like you know at first, they're like not really sure that that's exactly what's going to happen. They got like a damn jaguar on the side too. They pan over that. That other one where we forgot about the uh, the previous scene where they stole the eye of the snake. Yes, you remember with Thousand Doom was all kind of like butt hurt about that. You stole something from me. Well, well, but the that snake, that animatronic snake that they killed. Yeah, <laughs> that was hilarious. I mean, that was a funny scene. It reminded but... me of, like, Anaconda. I don't know if you ever saw that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they totally, they totally beat the crap out of that thing. But but it was kind of, I mean... Remember, like, Thorgum, that other big ogre-like type dude is, like, sad that his snake is dead, you know? <laughs> it's like, dude, you don't care about anything, and you care about this stupid snake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is just like a perfect uh, illustration of the ridiculousness of Conan the Barbarian. The movie it was so dumb, but it was so funny. Like, like here it is this big, this big snake that. Uh, well, and then obviously the whole human sacrifice element was pretty big in the movie too. Yeah, and um, you have a lot of these themes, like you said. You have the snake cult going on. You got this yeah. kind of hippie commune action going on, which doesn't make any sense with no. the snake cult. It exactly, rude. They juxtaposes not. itself. Yeah. It's exactly. so odd. <laughs> they. That's why you have to love this director, man. I'm telling you, like he's freaking crazy. It's like who does this? Like, well, I guess John Milius does this. You know, um, <laughs> they're like peace and love, man. But. uh you're gonna get you're gonna get eaten by a snake now, so it's cool. It's like wh- what? And that is like the complete like it works for like a sword and sorcery, fantastical fantasy, you know what it is type of thing. And um, and it's like okay, so they they're gonna go back and like and 
kind of the hornet's nest, uh, so to speak, uh, and try to get this princess. And they they sneak in, and they you know pretty soon are basically killing people left and right. Um, and they they pan, pans over, and it shows uh, Thulsa Doom as a snake, like kind of slither away into like some you know back. Um, trap door or whatever you know kind of just goes out of it while all this chaos is going on and um, you know uh, basically um, uh, you have um, you know I'm actually yeah we are I, I kind of I'm missing up, I'm messing up the uh, chronology a little bit because I thought it was like we because before we got to this point which is really kind of towards the end um no, we I had made mention to it before where Conan essentially dies. Um, oh yeah, His, you know, yeah, the resurrection was pretty. Uh, so he, yeah, because he gets captured. Yeah, he, he gets captured, and you know, um, this is when Thalsa Doom, you know, basically parades him around, you know, and and like you said, like he gets that girl to kind of come to him, and he says, "The power of flesh. It's not about steel. It's about flesh." And like he, you know, he even references like, oh, you know, I killed your parents or whatever. That was like unfortunate, but that was in my younger years. Yeah, and he's he's like, now I am now your father. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Uh-oh. laughs> That's kind of funny. That he's that's like, <laughs> yeah, you get that because of Star Wars too. It's like, yep, <laughs> hilarious. And they, and there's elements of that. There's elements of him going like, you know, like. Uh, well, like, look at your your body. Like, you have so much potential, and you've just wasted it, you know, uh, yeah. because you've you know basically defied me and stole from me and whatever. Um, and you've defied your father, kind of thing. But he's not like, really, yeah, yeah, exactly, but not really. And then he's like, you know, I, you know, we're gonna put him on the such and such tree. I forgot what he called it, and crucify him. You know, and it's like, it's like. That I think that scene with that tree, I might be wrong, has been in one of those pulp uh, fiction novels. But even if it wasn't, I think it it the the feel and look of it was very Conan esque, uh, from my understanding of the character in the stories. And you know, he's sitting there crucified on this tree, and he like eats a vulture like he spits it out maybe like, like he's like pecking at him and he just like grabs it by jugular and he bites like, it <laughs> yeah and it's like dude and this is where like he thinks he and then he like pans over he's about to pass out and die and he sees um he thinks like a uh super tie running uh, across the uh you know the desert essentially and then he like doesn't see him because he thinks it's a hallucination and he does see him and you get that music uh, going and it's that kind of cheerful thing. And he, you know, super repays the favor, just like Arnold uh, Conan's character saved him earlier. Super saves him for sure and gets him back. And that's where the wizard uh, does his magic and makes the deal with the gods. And, um, and Valeria is very uh, strident about it. You know, like you, you need to do this. You have to do this. She's, like did set on it doesn't matter yeah it doesn't matter if like basically you're gonna have to pay with life for death you know there's gonna be some there has to be a balance deal, deal being made she's like screw it and yeah i mean it kind of makes it to where like oh okay she loves him you know um and mm-hmm. that's kind of like i i guess what i asked you like is there something uplifting about it or good or true about it it's like well I, yeah in a way i think that definitely is one of the better I, you can't really call uh, Conan wholesome, but uh, that's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's like but, a, okay, yeah. it's a human characteristic, you know, a human emotion, a human virtue, even you know, uh, yeah. love, and you know it. So that's cool, you know. And the the thing, the the sad thing about it is, is of course, you know, the wizard was right. Uh, there is going to have to be um, life is going to have to pay for his death and for him and um when you know going back to where we were before we kind of before i wanted to get that um circle back to that uh to get us to where we're at now which is the 
the kind of I'd say the third act of the movie, and they go in there like we said. Well, when they escape, they they escape with the princess, so they get the princess. She doesn't want to go. She's still like, she like hisses at them, like you know. I don't know if you remember that, but she's like, just has this weird air about her, and Conan throws her around her shoulder and like runs out the cavern, and um, Thulsa Doom is like, you know, well, you know, we're gonna. I'm, you know, going to make this guy pay. He's going to know why uh, you fear the dark, you know, or you fear the mm-hmm. night. Yeah. You know, this <laughs> of... That's a very Bane kind of thing. Yeah. You don't know, you don't know the dark. <laughs> I've seen, I was molded by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> but, um. I had some practice. <laughs> and he goes like, he has the snakes again, you know, but they're like regular size snakes. And he makes them into arrows and he shoots yeah, it. Yeah, that was wild. Yeah, which I thought was pretty good for, you know, 81 or 82. Um, you know, that was like where you could just, it didn't look so ridiculous, like the uh, big, huge, giant snake. But, um, and it shoots it and it hits, of course, Valeria and she's poisoned and it kills her. Um, and again, you have this kind of, touching moment where she just wants him to look at her and kiss her and give her one, you know, breath in her mouth and this type of thing. And it's pretty, it's pretty over the top in a lot of ways, but it's not, it's not, it's like, okay, in the context of that time, to me that, that didn't, that wasn't the cheesy type of thing. It's just kind of like, it's, it, it, some people might think it is. It's like, why do we have this in this type? Oh, I of thought movie? it was completely cheesy. Yeah, it's it's it it, it 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 probably is, you know. But it, I feel like you almost have to have it in the sense of like, okay, now Conan is going to be really pissed, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, how else are you going to get him? Because I mean, he got away with the daughter, right? They they're going to bring it back to the king. They're going to get all the money. So if that was the case, he wouldn't have cared about you know, fighting Thulsa Doom. He could have ran away with the money and done whatever the hell he wanted to do, but he's not going to do that because he's Conan. You're all right, because he's the hero. He's got to make things right. (laughs) And so they have this, like, last stand, Custer's last stand, like, where he, like, sets booby traps up, and the wizard is walking around with, like, his weird, like, uh, old antique armor and um, <laughs> weapons and <laughs> the wizard. What a just a random character. What just a random weirdo. <laughs> it's like, what are you gonna do, dude? He's like, and then Conan's like, are are the gods gonna help? Because he's like, the gods are gonna be watching. He's like, uh, are they gonna help? And he's like, I don't know, or probably not, or whatever. And he's like, well, to hell with them, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like awesome. It's like, I mean, while like the. <laughs> The troops are the warriors are coming. Thulsa Doom's troops are coming. Conan like just you know makes like a speech like he's talking to Crumb. You know, it, what does he basically say? Like something to the effect of like I've never you, prayed to you before, but but <laughs> but, but. <laughs> I gotta open up. A, I gotta open a call on the call on the request line right now. One eight hundred Crumb. Like. like and I can like, use you right now, bro. And if you don't, you know, to the hell with you. you yeah, know? yeah, to, to hell. I love it. I love when Ar- Arnold, he sounds like such an old geezer when he says stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, and he was like in his prime. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> He's just saying old man things already. <laughs> yeah. And they have, you know, so the, they're outnumbered, but of course they do a good job fighting off these these warriors and and they get Conan gets to um, not only you know kill everybody that comes to that spot that they have as their like last stand. He actually you know kills both those. I don't know if they're brothers. Like their names are so bizarre. I don't even know what they were. They may have seen them once in the movie. Like the name like Thorgum, Thorgum and Rexar, <laughs> and they look like okay. big, big dudes. You know, like like Arnold's character. They're like you know well over six feet and, and thick dudes, big dudes, especially the yeah. guy that like, um, uses that big ass hammer. How ridiculous. Or hammer. Yeah, yeah. That was ridiculous. It was like the size of a law, like a free, an Oak log, like you put on a pole and like, yeah, I don't know. Like it, it looks like something like, 
It looks like something like you would see in like He Man cartoon or something, right? Know, basically, yeah. Um, but you know, Conan gets his gets his uh, vengeance on them. You know, dispatches them, and they you know defend themselves successfully, and um, basically. At that point, it becomes the Conan show, and uh, Subutai and and um, the witch or the wizard rather kind of exit the stage, and you see the you go back to like one of the gatherings of Thulsa Doom. This huge, like it almost looks like a Nuremberg rally or something. You know, like you have mm -hmm. yeah, like, you have like a lot of uh, of torches and lights, and there's just people all throughout the hillside uh crowded about by the you know thousands and Dulce doom is speaking to them i mean what did you think about that um that last scene like you yeah know. i definitely i definitely got those kind of kind of vibes from it um <laughs> but i also like you you, you kind of had the sense on that scene there was an impending doom and it was <laughs> going to be an impending doom for well you're kind of by this point, if you're not rooting for Conan, I mean, it's, you know, you're not rooting for, for the other guy. But, I mean, he, he kind of had a sense where he was, he was doing like a typical, I guess, I don't know, politician or typical, like, typical man in desperation. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, he was just, you know, saying something to say something to hopefully keep his people here, keep his followers, you know, entrusted to him. Yeah. And at the same, on the same token, he knew that somebody out there was really mad. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, it's almost like he didn't, like he didn't even know what happened. Right. I mean, I guess he didn't, know that it hit the expedition to go kill Conan, the men that he sent after him didn't work I mean, because he's kind of oblivious to everything. He's just going about his speech and, well, but know, he was there. I mean, he, he, yeah. he was there, so yeah. he saw it go down. Yeah. And he saw Conan and his, fr his, uh, his, his like underlings, his henchmen. Yeah. Just all fall. Yeah, so he did. Yeah, I mean, he did. He saw that go down. But it's like I don't understand why he just doesn't. He's acting as if like I guess he, yeah. Fig, I, he figured like Conan wasn't going to come after him in his stronghold. You know, I guess I don't. Yeah, know. yeah. He didn't have. Yeah, he didn't have like the audacity to do it when <laughs> <laughs> throughout the whole movie, Conan just wants to kill him. Like that's <laughs> the whole point of the movie is Conan wants to kill him. <laughs> Yeah, and when he finally gets, you know, he approaches him up there, you know, he kind of just butchers him, you know, right there. Uh, and that's pretty, that's probably like one of the more, that's probably like the, it's a rated R movie. That's probably like the most brutally violent scene is when he like decapitates Dulce Doom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean. I mean, throughout the, all the all the rest of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the other stuff is not violent, but it's like that's like, okay, we get, we get, it, we do get a, a decapitation in the movie too. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, I don't know, like, I guess at this point, um, is there, I guess, some of the things that anything in like closing that would be kind of worthwhile to talk about um, a little bit about. I, things that you, I forgot to mention or things that you might have had that you might uh, want to say. Uh, one of the things I was going to say that was funny is that um, there was like the dog scene in the beginning. I don't remember. There's these Rottweilers and they had little like leather outfits on their heads and necks. It was funny. Like when the guys roll in to uh, destroy the village that Conan's living in as a kid. There's a bunch of war, you know, attack dogs, um, war dogs. Oh like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think real quick, uh, his actual dad gets eaten and mauled by them. And they were, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was strange. Yeah. I didn't. I... <laughs> um, I mean, uh, the the kind of 
the the long another montage of him pushing that weird grain mill or whatever it was like when he was a you know a slave and he just all he does is just like pushing it around and around in a circle um you know um the the kind of losing your dad and mom violently i mean with his mom being like right there and her holding his hand while that happened um yeah that scenes like that it make it uh pretty bad for a kid i think to watch mm -hmm. and i'm thinking about it um and i think that um you know we could talk about a little bit about like you know over the next couple minutes um about like i guess why you think uh film films like this really aren't going to be made anytime soon um and kind of like what i don't know like if, if if there's something that's what is any if anything is there a film that's been made in the past 10 years or or so that you would compare i mean you, we got the the conan that um with jason momoa in in 2011 which i i never ended up finishing watching that uh because i just couldn't get past the fact that he wasn't the conan that i thought was conan you know um but that one i mean some people like that one you know um and that was made exactly 10 years ago uh you know it it it, it develops more of his backstory more um so it is a completely different rendition of it i mean is there any I don't know, like, I think of, like, when I think of, it's like, what action movies do you have that are like this? And I don't really know of any, any time recently, and I, I would be, like, going to movies like John Wick, and, you know, which is, of course, not a, a Hyperborea yeah. uh, uh, fantasy, but it's a ultra-violent action masculine movie, mm -hmm. you know? I would think of uh, John Wick a little bit. I would think of like Taken, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, that's yeah. another story event. That's a good story for vengeance. That's for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> Django Unchained. <laughs> yeah, that, that was over the top. Yeah, it, like a Tarantino film of of revenge. Like a lot of of well, yeah, of course yeah. Tarantino. I mean, he's gonna. Be, uh oh, and uh, what what was the other one? Uh Grindhouse. Grindhouse, and then yeah, what was the other movie attached Kill Bill. to Grindhouse? Kill Bill. Oh, Kill, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Kill Bill was gratuitous. Um, the hateful. Well, hateful eight really wasn't. Now, uh, I mean, there's, there's gratuitous violent movies now, but I'm just trying to think of a movie that's that's like overtly masculine for masculine masculinity's sake. You know, in a lot of ways, like this one is in that way, even if it's not a throwback to like some mystical time or some shoot the, the one of the, one of the only ones that i could think of that really really permeates everything is is still lord of the rings i mean yeah like and that's that's that was kind of masculinity and all kind of different you know yeah. all different aspects and capacities too um yeah. and also feminine qualities very you know the, definitely yeah. feminine qualities yeah, because it's it's playing on, you know, and those in the early two thousands, it's playing on such a like we talked about before in the podcast, like it's playing on so many uh, older tr uh, kind of um, archetypes, and it's why it is part of why it holds up. Um, but it's such a grand narrative and, a, and an epic, and I I don't know if I don't know like. It's kind of funny. I mean, uh, it it seems like today, like we don't, you, you really can't um, be unapologetic, unapologetically, um, you know, masculine. And you know, and you have to be like, if you are, you know, it's something like taken where you're uh, defending your child or you're getting, you know, you're trying to get someone back. Uh, for something particularly like some type of vendetta or something like that, but um, it's it's in a way like you talked uh, you touched on it some with westerns in a sense like and the outlaw uh, has it that has 
a similar theme, right, in, in, in a broad sense to Conan because he is outside the domain of law and order and there is no, like, real semblance of at least any um, any order. legitimate, yeah, legitimate authority or order. Yeah. You know, it's illegitimate. So you, so you root for Conan for a variety of reasons. You root for him because of the loss of his family. You root for him because Thalsa Doom is evil. Um, you root for him because he's a man of action. Um, you know, he doesn't take any crap. Uh, and he, he, you root for him because he's just a badass. He's Arnold, you know, I mean, but, um, yeah, well, I mean, it's on a, it's like on a, yeah, like you said, unapologetic masculinity. Like, there's no, yeah, I can't think of a movie that's just straight out. I mean, Jason Momoa might be the only character, and and, and well, I'll say Jason Momoa and and um, The Rock, you know, um, yeah, Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, I think he he's kind of, I guess the those two guys are the guys in film today that. Uh, in my eyes, John I, Cena. Okay, yeah. yeah, the guy that plays Thor. I don't know his name. Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. So we got we got some. Okay. Fun. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, okay. There's there's that was an overt. That's like one of the more unapologetically masculine characters I can think of is Thor. Yeah. I mean, because under God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because he's obviously a god, but he's obviously acts like one, and it's. It's just so strange to me on how it hard it is to find. Well, it doesn't surprise me because of how woke Hollywood likes to likes to portray themselves as. But it also doesn't surprise me that like it takes a superhero to emulate those virtues. But at the same time, Thor isn't really see. That's the weird part about Thor because he's not really a superhero. Like in the traditional sense he's a su- well in the traditional sense yes he's a superhero but in like the marvel sense he's an adaptation you know so it's 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 weird to call him yeah. flat out like a like a superhero but but yet i guess too he's that strong yeah i mean he's the strongman archetype for norse mythology just like hercules is the strongman archetype for exactly. greek mythology yep um, so, I mean, it's like, it's like you have, and the, I guess we have, yeah, we have, have that archetype. Yeah. We, it's not. Yeah. So I think it, I think it's fair to say that it's not like it's completely gone. Like, I mean, um, you know, yeah, Chris Pratt is another person that plays, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, to some of these themes. So it's not completely gone. Um, I guess the, the, the main differences that I see is that. I mean, a lot of the the newer movies I haven't seen, you know, in the past, like I'd say, I don't know, seven, eight, eight years or something. Like I haven't kept up with. I don't, you know, watch a lot of action movies. I'm just kind of uh, tangently aware of, like I said, um, like something like the John Wick uh, movies and uh, Jason mm-hmm. Statham, you know, transport transporter series back in like early early 2000s um and it, yeah so they're there you know they're there but it's it's the kind of combination of of masculinity of hand-to-hand combat uh and then throwing it into a, like a bottle of of fantasy and pulp and sword and sorcery you you don't you definitely don't, it's not the time that it was with Beastmaster and um, He Man and uh, you know like I said before Highlander and and uh, those type of things. I mean hell even in um, it was uh, two thousand and four when uh, Troy was made again and that, that was pretty good uh, of the Trojan War with you know it has Brad Pitt playing. Uh, Achilles and um, this other guy playing Hector that I think did a really good job. But I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's not, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's just a different, it's a different era, man. Like um, the eighties, the eighties were like filled to the brim with overt um, masculinity and 
and just guys being guys and yeah i mean the rocky movies i mean think about like rocky four with the whole um russian soviet union you know oh the, yeah okay yeah. think about Lundgren. think about yeah. like think, uh, think about the um i guess um uh, I get John Claude Van Damme was another like okay. B movie eighties uh, guys, nineties early blood 90s. sport. Yeah, blood sport, kickboxer, uh, Universal yep. Soldier. Yep. Um, but like Universal Soldier was a remake of a remake, though, too. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And uh, and I guess again, like the more I think about that, the more I kind of see that it's not really true that these that you can't find it in film today because you have like these expendables. I, I never was into it. I mean, but I think there was like three of them, you know, and that's just a bunch of, you know, eighties movie stars coming together and kind of rehashing, you know, uh, the kind of exploitation over the top, um, aggressive, uh, action packed movie. Uh, when you had guys like, you know, Randy Couture coming in from MMA mm -hmm. and um and getting those those other stars like uh, Van Dam and and Lundra, uh Dolph Lundgren and those type of dudes. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I feel like there's just always going to be uh, room for it and need for it, and I hope that they you know continue to kind of try to try to make some of this stuff. It's, it there's so much. There's so much um, material out there in fantasy. It's not not just with sci-fi, but we got you know Dune coming out later in the year. You know we have is epic, right? Um, epic, epic uh, movie with a ton of potential, and it, and and that has elements of fantasy. It's not just sci-fi. You know, it's very. Um, world building and, and atmospheric and um, immersive if it's done right. Well, um, and even yeah. you have um, like an alien Ripley, like they've yes. with the new aliens, they've tried to replace her character, you know, with, with other reiterations, I guess, of the same character and they just haven't been the same. And obviously, you know, Ripley isn't a masculine character but she has masculine qualities to her. Yes, exactly. And, yeah. and it's done I mean, in this way that it's funny you bring that up. Cause I think that that, um, that characters with the original alien and, and aliens, uh, she, to me, it was like one of the few examples where a female lead, she really is like the first female heroine, uh, action star because the alien came out, I think in 1979, and mm -hmm. aliens came out sometime in like the 80s i don't know if it was 84 85 something like that and um yeah she but she, the way that she's a hero it doesn't really diminish men in some senses right like some movies yeah. do today you know it's like it's it, yes it's crazy sci-fi horror elements of it and aliens are every you know going it's 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 nuts but it's like she's not like learning how to be uh, a ninja in one day or something. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like Ray. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, it, <laughs> I, it's a good, it's a good kind of like, I, I can handle that. You know, I can appreciate that. I, I don't think that it um, takes away from uh, men or manliness or masculinity or, you know, mm -hmm. like you said like there's a lot of different elements of of what it means to be a man and what it means to be heroic and brave for sure uh but it's just i don't know it's something about uh conan that brings about in my mind like a kind of um a bygone era that you know we may never really get back to which yeah, is, because it was just so unabashed. It was just so unapologetically like yeah. we need to be masculine for for men's sake. Like, yeah. Uh, but but I mean, you do you do in some capacity. You have it. See, I think out of the Rock and John Cena, John Cena is the more like wholesome. You know, I'm 
I'm the guy. Oh, well, then you even have it with, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like, I guess Ice T, Ice Cube. Like, you even have it with those guys in, in some capacities, too. Like, it's different on how it's, like, become culturally, I guess, culturally diverse in a way. Because, like, it's more across the spectrum. <laughs> I mean, you get, you know, you kind of got, like... I remember, rem, ugh, I remember one of the uh, funniest lines in Twenty One Jump Street was Ice Cube going, "Of course, of course, I'm black. I'm pissed off, and I'm the captain. You know how hard it took me to get to this position. I'm saying, embrace your stereotypes." And I'm like, <laughs> you know, to me, like that's a very masculine thing to say. You know, like take yeah. it on the chin, deal with it, be a man, shut up. And just you know, do do you know do, do your do. duty? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, like in a sense, like it's there. There's there's ways where where Hollywood does still play with it, you know. And obviously, that was for all comedic, you know, intensive purposes. That was how he, you know, how he dealt with it. But I mean, to me, like that, you know, like that. The, the values are still there no matter like no matter how much they want to put the word toxic in front of it like you all you need that you need that character with those qualities you know no matter if it's a woman character like Ripley or you know an un, unapologetic character like the mini the mini Arnold has embodied you know it's it's one of those where it's just it's just it keeps you know it those themes are just they're there, you know, and they're, they're, they're hard to ignore. So it's just yeah, I mean, and how they try to kill it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's okay to be, uh, not only is it not, not only is it okay to be competent and strong and, you know, brave. It's, it's what we need is we're, we're required to, to be that, you know, uh, and it should go without saying, but unfortunately, sometimes things get really uh, misconstrued and, and distorted and, and, you know, it's just kind of a, I guess a characteristic of the world we live in today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I don't think it's, I think the more they kind of try to um, suppress it and bottle it up and ignore it, the, it's going to find a way out, not just in, um, everyday life and, and individual people, but in in art and theater and drama and you know story and in books and comic books and all that. I mean, in video games, even you know, it's you just can't get rid of it, and you shouldn't get rid of it because it's you know we it's something that we need. Um, we need you know men need it, families need it, uh, we need it as a people. Um, and like you said, quite rightly that. Uh, you know, even if it's in, even if it is a female exhibiting it in t to one degree or another, it's all it does is it kind of shows you that he, he, you have to have it and you can't get rid of it. Um, so, uh, JP, uh, that was, uh, fun. It was great, uh, talking to you about Conan and these kind of masculinity themes and, epic craziness that is Conan the Barbarian. Um, <laughs> so I look forward to... It was most enjoyable. It was, <laughs> it, yeah, and you know what, too? There's uh, there's actually this really cool Mongolian... I'll, I'll have to send you a link, but there's okay. this cool Mongolian rock band, I quote-unquote, I guess you could call them. They're called... It's funny whenever I bring them up because they're called The Who. The Who band, you know, like yeah. The Who. But, yeah. but like it's H U and stuff, and it was it was kind of cool on how that wizard was trying to invoke that resurrection spell. Yeah, um, because he was doing, and this is this is kind of neat too. What he was doing was this uh, throat singing, and I guess oh. in Mongolian culture, it, it's it's huge. Like that's part of their instrumentation is this like throat Dirtle singing. Throat. Yeah, like yeah, esophagus, like yeah, it is rot, awesome. Rot and talk about like yeah, the depth of like I guess the human voice, and in particular, the male voice. 
Mm -hmm. um you know these guys that are able to do it in this band i just you know i'm blown away by it but i also stumbled across and this is kind of cool because you said about the whole you know like cultures kind of kind of blending together in conan um european there's apparently like i guess it's big amongst amongst like the viking cultures you know or the scandinavian cultures too they do it in in a capacity as well so I'm like, well, shoot. <laughs> yeah, there must be some, there's some type, there, and that's, again, like, uh, that's what uh, Conan at its best probably um, comes down to is getting to this kind of primordial um, essence or uh, spirit of, of, you know, what, what can't be stopped, that what, what must go on uh, and what must be part of, you know, the human endeavor and in, in, in man itself. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to play a scene that's great from Conan to close out. Thank you, JP, for coming on. And people can find you on YouTube, right? Yep. I'm on the YouTubes and uh, I'm on the Telegrams. And, and, uh, and I'll link your, uh, link your channel in the uh, description below when I uh, do the show notes. Uh, thank you again, JP. Uh, good, good talking with you. It's been fun. For sure. Thank you for having me. All right, man. Here we go. All right. Oh, dog, yay! We won again. This is good. But what is best in life? The open step, three tours, falcons at your wrist, and the wind in your hair. Run, Conan. What is best in life? Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and you hear a lamentation of your women. <laughs>